I'm Chris Stafford, and this is Art, the podcast where we get to know the women behind their art. My guest this week is Madeline Bunbury, an English equine artist who paints life portraits of horses and ponies. At just 28, Madeline is aspiring to follow in the footsteps of her idol, George Stubbs, aligning with other great equine painters such as Agass, Munnings and Herring. Madeline was born on the island of Mustique in 1995. One of four children, her mother Lottie is a fashion designer and her father Michael a doctor. She grew up in an island playground and from an early age sketching and painting was instinctive and more accessible than riding ponies which she dreamed of. It was when she began her education at boarding school in England that she was able to indulge herself and become a horse-mad teenager, taking every opportunity to ride. Her love of horses became the catalyst to her initial plan to become a veterinarian, but she had to abort that idea once she failed the required science exams. It was then that she decided on a career in art, with the confidence that this was something for which she had a talent. With the guidance of an artistic uncle and aunt, Madeline spent three years studying traditional portraiture at the Charles Cecil Studios in Florence, Italy. It was to prove the launching pad for her to embark on a career as an equine artist, and she was soon making a livelihood painting horse portraits. Madeline can be found either in her studio in Fosbury, Wiltshire, or travelling to horses across the UK and around the world. Her latest project is a series of 16 breeds of British native horses and ponies, which, as well as producing very large paintings, will also be a coffee book and perhaps a documentary. Madeleine, hi, welcome to the Art Podcast. Hello, Chris. Well, nice to have you here. Talking horses, you know I can talk horses all day and all night, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, that's all we could talk about. But that's all you paint, isn't it? It is. I'm often asked to paint dogs and I have to um, send them on to my other friends who do beautiful dog portraits because I am stuck on my one trick pony which is painting horses. Well I'm with you all the way on this because as as I shared with you when I was a little girl I always wanted to paint my pony or draw my pony and I never could. I just never could and you were taught to paint what you see and not what you know, and to my point. And I, I think that was great advice because now you fully practice that, don't you? So, so. I have also studied a lot of anatomy. And after almost 10 years now of painting horses, I, I can paint a decent horse, I'd say, just from memory. But definitely it helps having the horse in front of me. So the work of George Stubbs, of course, is famous, Madeleine, you know, for the way he used to record those anatomies. You know, he would sit with carcasses for hours and days on end to do that. Fortunately, you don't have to do that because you're not making anatomical drawings. But how much of that work teachings have influenced you? Oh, my gosh. My first ever book was a book by George Stubbs of the anatomy of the horse. And to be honest, we did learn... In Florence, when I was there painting, we learned the anatomy of humans. And Charles Cecil, my teacher, always said it was so important to know what's underneath the skin so you can see where the bones sort of stick out and where the muscle would then lie over, you know, make a more fleshy part to a bony contour. And for the horses, it, I find it, it it's so important to know the structure of especially the legs, just the angle that the legs sort of come out of the body and then you know how the hind legs will bend backwards and then meet at the hock and then I take another angle down to the floor and I think I'm lucky that because I've been around horses my whole life it's just something I know better than somebody who might not have spent much time with horses. So did you study those anatomical drawings then in in George Stubbs' Anatomy of the Horse? I definitely used to. I should go back and, and do some more studying but but I used to know all the how many ribs each you know the horse had and the number of bones in the body. But um, with my 
old age. I've rather forgotten. Well, let's go back to those beginnings then, because as you said, you've always been a horsey girl, which is not uncommon for anyone with a British accent. So where did that all begin for you? Because you were born and grew up on the island of Mystique, which w- would not be necessarily associated with horses. I know, Chris. Isn't it funny? I think apparently there's this thing that horse people are just born with this love for horses because my parents are not at all interested in horses. And as you said, I grew up in this tiny island where there are about 10 horses in total and they'd all been shipped in from England. But I just lived my life pretending to be this English girl with all the horses in the countryside, although all we did was sort of ride them down the beach. In this. <laughs> but it was... um. I don't remember the first time I got on a horse. It's just been something I've always done on my own accord. Were horses in the family? Did your parents ride? Not at all, no. I mean, they know about horses, but they're not interested. So where did that come from, do you think, that you know that keen interest, you know, from just riding ponies on a beach to actually becoming something that you were passionate about? It might be down to the fact that my parents weren't interested, which meant that if I wanted to ride, I had to organise everything myself and the years of begging and begging for a pony. And then finally, uh, one lucky 13th birthday when I was, I actually moved to boarding school in England by then. And this pony was everything to me. And I st- actually, I still have her now to this day, little Peggy. Peggy's still with you. Yep, still my number one pony. She's uh, 20 years old now. That's wonderful. Where did you go to school in Dorset? I started at a little prep school called Port Regis and spent a couple of years there before moving on to St Mary's, which is a Catholic school for good convent girls. And that didn't last uh, the whole way through. I actually was... I, I left school a year early because I desperately wanted to be a vet. And so I took all the science A-levels and um, failed, failed miserably so badly that I actually didn't go back for the final year. And luckily, that was like the fateful moment. Instead, I went and studied art in Florence. So that's a big decision. You know, once you had failed the prerequisites then, to be the vet that you wanted to be. Was that really, really disheartening, disappointing? Did that really burst your bubble? Oh, my gosh, Chris. I felt like the greatest failure. It was unbelievable, the um, the sort of shock (laughs) finding out that I couldn't become what I wanted to be. And I'm just so lucky that always, all the way through life, I'd always drawn and painted horses. And it was actually my parents. You know, most parents would, would be quite angry with their child for failing and my parents just said that's fine whatever just you're not meant to be a scientist go and study art that's what you're good at and so there I was age 17 I went off to Florence for three years. So let's go back to those sketches then as a little girl how did that all start where was where was the influence to to be drawing when you were a child? Didn't come from my father he's a science man he's a doctor But my mother, who's a fashion designer, always had art materials around. We had beautiful sketchbooks and watercolour paints, and it was her influence that started me on painting and drawing. And what about your siblings? Was that a family affair, or are there other uh, other your siblings who are also interested in art? We all started drawing, painting around the kitchen table, and... My sister and I actually used to spend hours and hours drawing together. You know those um, printer paper, just basic paper? We now have huge stacks of those in our childhood bedrooms just with drawings of horses and horses and horses. So I think I might have influenced her to draw horses as well, but she's slightly moved on from that. (laughs) Well, I was going to ask what the subject was. So it was always animals then? Oh, always. I mean... No, horses, only horses. Not even the pet dogs or cats or anything? No, very rarely. Maybe a little dog would make it into the scene, but we had just wrote storybooks about horses and this dream life that's all set in England because 
obviously I was this Caribbean girl, but desperate to be a little English girl. And was there riding in the school programs where you were in Dorset? No, I had to um, go out on the weekends to go riding because my pony lived with cousins down the road. And I remember just being so keen to get out that I would get a rucksack full of my riding clothes and literally hitchhike from the school door miles down the road to go and see the pony before sunset. There was no stopping you then? Nope. I think that's exactly what spurred on my keenness. Yes, exactly. It was meant to be. Well, I can relate to that. As you as you know, that was my first career. So I totally identify with that obsession. But you made it into a career. Now, tell us a little bit about why you chose to turn left, so to speak, and head to Italy to study <laughs> and, and why you chose the tutors that you did, the school that you did. It was all just so much luck and circumstance. In that, luckily, I failed my exam, so I couldn't really go back to school. And luckily, again, my aunt and uncle were teaching at the Charles Cecil Studios, which is uh, renowned for you know, excellent portraiture. Charles Cecil, I'd say, is one of one of the most, if not the most, famous portrait teacher. So he actually wasn't keen on accepting me at age seventeen, not because of my artistic or lack of artistic skill but more that he was concerned that a young girl in Florence would have you know start skipping classes and things and um, I proved him wrong I was the first one in every morning worked way hard yeah and I can imagine that was pretty idyllic being based in Florence you can't get closer to art than being based in, in Italy and in Florence and when you mentioned your aunt and uncle there, tell us a little bit more about their art involvement. So my uncle Calixt is, he's now a sculptor, but he did train with Charles for years and he was one of his tutors. So Charles ran the studio, but he'd often have old students come back and teach younger years. And um, that's where he met my aunt, who was also training. And um, they're happily married and live just outside of Florence in Tuscany. And they're both, she paints and he's sculpting, so living a totally artistic life. So it's in the genes then, Madeline. You're not the first. I'm not the first, <laughs> no. My grandmother's very artistic and musical. And not actually, I'd say all my aunts and uncles on my mother's side are all artistic. But are you musical at all? Did, did you have to go through piano lessons when you were a child? I did. When I was young, and then then I started hating piano lessons because they got in the way of uh, sports, and so I promptly gave up the piano until I left school. And then I had this yearning to learn, and it was sort of too late uh, to get a teacher because I was out in Florence. So I learned from YouTube, and now I, I play the piano every day. It's sort of part of my routine. That's wonderful. What a lovely discipline. I'm with you there. Is the music influence something that you embrace as an artist that you can take to your studio? I mean, how 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 big a part of how much of a role does music then have in in your life and as an artist? I'd say not that much. Purely that I I play the piano to de-stress after painting because I find painting so intense and stressful. Quite stressful, yeah, because I'm, you know, trying and trying to get the painting right. And especially when I have live horses and it's all encompassing. When the horse comes into the studio, I can only concentrate on painting that horse because I only have a limited amount of time that the horse will stand and be painted. And so there's, um, it's, it's not the most relaxing <laughs> way to paint. I think it's very brave of you, actually, to take on a, a live horse. Uh, I don't know how many people do that today, but when I found you on Instagram and you were doing this, I thought, this is an interesting technique. You must be very patient yourself as well as your subject. I can tell you I didn't start out being patient. It's taken years to learn. So how do you get these subjects to and, and someone to hold the horse for, for an amount of time? What 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 is the tip? I mean, is, is there a typical sitting? I'm sure it depends on the horse's patience, you know, and, and their tolerance uh, and keeping them amused with polo mints probably. 
how do you set this up and get a willing person to stand and hold the horse? I'm very lucky that I've got some really generous friends who will come and give me an hour of their time. So I, I have the studio all set up and the painting ready to go. And as soon as my friends arrive, uh, I will bring the we bring the horses in and we spend an hour and they get a chair and they get to sit in the studio and with the, <laughs> in the company of the horses. And I always bring two horses in at the same time because, as you would know, one horse alone is never happy to stand. Then after painting, that's when we get to have the lovely biscuits and tea, and that that's um, usually their payment in return. Well, I was hoping you were going to say you give them an adult beverage and uh, some nibbles and keep them amused for that amount of time. I should do that next time. I think so. I think you need to up the ante here, Madeline. You know, um, <laughs> you, you get probably get more volunteers. You're absolutely right. Cheese board and wine that'll keep them coming. So in preparation for the live sittings, do you go and meet the horse and take a pencil sketch of the horse? Do you actually get to know the anatomy of that horse, the physique, the confirmation before you set him up in the studio? No. Um, often, because I paint horses you know, from life, so I actually go out to wherever the horse is, if it's around in England or America, India, uh, Argentina, all these places I've been, I will go with my canvases and I don't sketch. I will literally set up the big canvas because they're often life size next to the horse and we just start. You just go straight to it. Mm -hmm. And how big are the canvases? Oh my gosh, they're huge. <laughs> they, I often have to stand on sort of chairs or ladders to get to the top. The, um, the biggest one I've done is sort of three metres long, by like two metres tall. And these ones, when I'm, tr when I'm transporting them to places like India, they have to like, take them all flat pack with a roll of canvas and the long wooden stretcher bars and have them all built and put together when I get to the location. Yes, I can imagine you'd have to do it that way round. So when you graduated from the Charles Sissel Studio in, in Florence... Did you have in mind, and this is the way I'm going to do things, I'm going to paint from live horses, I'm going to do live sittings, and this is going to be my style? Or didn't you start off with something smaller and think, well, this is a little bit handier, you know, just working off an easel, a small easel, smaller canvases? Tell me about the, the map in, you had in your mind. Well, the map I had was that I would leave art school and become a super famous artist in a, in a year. And um, that that didn't happen. But what I, because of Charles Cecil's teaching, he always has a live model, and we always painted life size. So to me, it was just obvious that I would always have a live horse and always paint life size. And I went off and straight away invested in some large canvases and rove myself around England, basically staying with generous friends who had horses. And I would paint their horse in return for having me to stay. And I did this for a couple of years and surviving by their charity and generosity until suddenly somebody wanted to pay me for my paintings. And then somebody else wanted to and, and then another person and it just grew and grew until suddenly I could actually survive off my, off my earnings. And the rest is history. You're still making history because you're only what, 28. So I think there's plenty of time to, to make history. But I'm wondering when you, when someone offered to pay you for your first ones, what did you know how to value them? I had no idea. It was, it was so difficult. And it's still so difficult to know what is acceptable. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? I think as an artist to 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 be able to value your work. It's different when you're you know firmly established, you know, and further down the road. So what kind of requests are you getting then for commissions now? Mostly I do a lot of head portraits of horses. But my favorite thing is always to do the life size full body. And that's what I would love to do more of and not I you know, sometimes I'll do smaller paintings. But I try my best to can persuade the uh, patron to have a, 
enormous portrait done. And presumably this is in oils, is it, Madeline? It is all in a very traditional style oil paints, which I grind from ha- by hand. I, I buy pigments and make my own paints and put them in tubes. And this is probably coming from your teachings in Florence. That's the way it was done huh? originally. Exactly. Everything I learned. We use very few colours as well. It's all a very a simple and traditional style of painting. Actually, only four colours. And what are they? So that is a an ivory black, lead white, yellow ochre, and a vermilion red. And that out of those four colours, you can produce these beautiful portraits of horses of different colours. Yeah, any any natural colour. Until I need to put something like blue. If there's a bit of sky, I want to make blue. Then I have to get a cerulean blue. But apart from that. Just those four. Well, tell us about some of your favourites so far, where you've travelled and the kind of commissions you've had and, and, and the breeds of horses that you've been painting. One of the best ones I've done quite recently was in India, in Rajasthan. I was painting a Marwari stallion, which is, the, I'd say, India's most famous breed of horse. These stunning, slim-built, fine and flighty horses And the stallion came dressed in his dancing gear, which is incredible velvet rugs with gold tassels and these bells around his ankles and his knees and even on his bridle and all over his back, these sort of jingling bits of gold and silver. And it was absolutely fascinating painting him. Yes, I mean, rich in colour. I would imagine that was a dream. So much shiny material and the deep sort of red velvet. It was Oh, it was delicious to paint. Yes, I can well imagine. And where is that hanging? So that's actually in my collection because I'm collecting breeds of horses, uh, 80 different breeds I want to have at the end of my lifetime, I suppose. And he is now on my wall in my studio in Wiltshire. And what size? He is two metres tall by 280 centimetres. Makes me think of Whistlejack, you know, how, how huge he was. Do you know the dimensions of his portrait? I don't, and that's dreadful because I really should. I'm going to have to look that up straight after. Okay, I've, I've given you some homework because I need you to, to do some homework on Jacques Laurent Agasse, the Swiss painter who was a contemporary of George Stubbs. Because I did years ago a comparative study of the two at the uh, Court Olds in London. Ah. Fascinating. I haven't heard of him before, but yeah. Um, anyway, more to learn about these wonderful equine artists. Now, you've told me that you're going to be doing some more traveling for uh, live portraits. Tell us a little bit more about those. At the moment, my project is going to be set in Britain. I'm doing the Great British Breeds, which is I've selected 16 of uh, British breeds to paint life-size portraits of. And actually today I've just finished the first one. So just 15 to go. And which one was this? This was the sweetest little um, pony. It's a British spotted pony and it's a mini little one. And he is a circus pony. So he's in the painting, he's under a spotlight and he has his beautiful blue harness on and he's this little black and white polka dot pony, and it couldn't be cuter. You know, I love this idea of this project, capturing these breeds and capturing them, you know, as live paintings. Because, you know, when you're a little girl in England, and if you're pony mad, you learn about all those native breeds. And there are so many in England, aren't there? I mean, and we don't, unless you go to a horse show, you know, a showing class, realise just how rich that history is and to capture them the way you're planning to, I think is going to be uh, something, you know, that that you can be proud of for the rest of your life. And it will go down actually in equine uh, portraiture history, I would imagine. That would be the dream. But I'm just excited that they they will all be life-size. So we'll have the enormous Shire horse and then have a portrait of the, the miniature Shetland next to it, just so people, when they see the exhibition, they can really tell the difference between <laughs> you know, the sizes of these animals. Yeah, and 16 of them then, 
and life size, as you say, is going to take up quite a bit of space. So where is the exhibition going to be held once you've done them all? Well, that hasn't yet been decided. I'm going to have to find a worthy spot. Yes, that, and I think something that you, you probably, when you go around, I, I imagine you photograph them as well, so you can take them home and, and, and have photographs. Well, I am the world's worst photographer, so luckily my greatest friend, Georgina Preston, who is the world's greatest photographer, um, she comes and takes pictures while I paint of me painting and of a horse, um, you know, beautiful portraits. Yeah. So, well, that that how then how are you going to combine those two mediums then, Madeline? How, and uh, are there other things that are going to come out of this? Are you going to like film the process of it all and make a documentary of the making of? I would love to do a documentary. It's some yeah, definitely an idea. But what we will do is have a coffee table book made of a painting of the British breeds. So it'll be. Yeah, you know, photographs of the process and then photographs of the horse and a little bit of writing about each breed. That's wonderful. Do you have a publisher? Not yet. Lots of things to work on, but the project will take <laughs> the project will take two years. Yeah, I'd imagine easily. Now have you found your subjects already? So I found a handful of them, which is enough to keep me busy for the meantime. And then I just I trust that the next breed I need it'll appear and someone will generously give up their pony or horse for me to paint for the week. Yes, and presumably they do this, you know, out of love of the project, so they're volunteering the horse or the pony and their time to be part of this project. Yes, I'd hope so, because these people people often have these rare breed horses, such as the, the Suffolk Punch or the Shire Horse, and they would like to see that horse painted as much as I would, so... You know, for the posterity of the horse, and once a horse is, or anyone is painted in oil paints, that should last you know, forever. Absolutely. So, name all the the breeds that are going to be part of this series. I, I should have my list, but I can go down. We've got the uh, Shire Horse, a Clydesdale, a Suffolk Punch, a Thoroughbred, a Cleveland Bay, Hackney Horse, a Welsh Cob. Welsh Mountain Ponies times three because of all their different types. And then Shetland, Miniature Shetland, Exmoor, Dartmoor, um, Bell Ponies. Dale. Dale, Dale, yep. And there's another New Forest. I think that's... Oh, what about the Exmoor? Did we say Exmoor? Yep, said Exmoor. That's a wonderful list, and I think, you know, so many of those classic breeds there. This is going to be such a fun project, Madeline. You must be so excited about it. I really am. I'm like a little little child. I just want to paint them all. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I can see this as a coffee book, and, and I can see the exhibition. You'll have to tell us where that's going to be when you reach that um conclusion because it's, as you say it's a long project probably going to last you a couple of years to get these all done and there's this sort of in between because it's something that you're you're financing yourself presumably you don't have sponsorship for this and and you're doing this alongside the, your paid jobs exactly i've got to keep up enough commissions in between so i can buy these huge canvases and take the time out to, to collect the paintings yeah don't be tempted to buy any of these ponies you know and take them home that's that's a bit of a problem. I fear I might fall in love with all of them. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, tell us more about some of your paid commissions that you're working on as well. So one, I suppose, things I've done in the past. One great exciting one was I painted for the Household Cavalry in London in Knightsbridge and this beautiful horse called Trojan that was brought to me every day and it was tacked up in obviously all its army gold procession kit and sort of jingled across the courtyard and then came into the arena where I'd set up this huge portrait of him. And I was staying there for a couple of weeks, actually, in the mess. And so I got to see the whole life of the British army officers in the household cavalry and even got to ride out in Hyde Park on some of the horses. How lovely. Yes, that, that would be splendid, I would imagine. And he would probably be a subject that stood quite still for you. 
that was his job. I said, he was so well trained at standing still. He was the best model. For sure. And you told me that you were going to be coming over to the States here to Middleburg. Tell us more about that. So I actually spent uh, every year I make a trip over to Middleburg just because there's so many horses out there and people who need their horses painted. So that's um, every October or so I pack up my paints and just take on commissions from various people in the area of Middleburg. And you're also going to do something at the National Sporting Library. Yeah, so this is a first. I'm going to be... We're, we're doing sort of a, a teaching program where we're having a live pony come into the museum every day where I'll have set up a life-size portrait to be painting. And then I'll be taking classes throughout the week and letting people paint alongside and giving them small helps and critiques throughout the day. Now, I was going to ask you this about teaching as well as painting and and workshops, because so many artists that I've spoken to, as you will know, Madeline, they also teach and they teach workshops and do that quite a lot. Obviously, another income stream. Is this something that you enjoy doing or could you could see yourself doing more of later in life? Perhaps later in life, but at the moment... I'm still going back and taking courses with my old teachers, so I still need to learn a lot more before I can teach. Tell me more about those influences and who you'd like to study under if you're not already studying under them. So I'd say my my favourite artist in the way that she paints and just the way that she is, is an artist called Isabella Watling, and she paints the most stunningly beautiful portraits of of people and if I could paint horses like she paints people I I would die happy and who else is there that you uh, would like to study with so there are other um are we talking just female or male as well male as well yes well I think about landscape artists there's an artist who's actually married to Isabella Watling is George Clark, and he paints the most stunning landscapes. And they're exactly the type that I'd like to learn to paint my horses in these kind of very delicate and soft landscapes that just fade away from you into the distance and he's got a beautifully soft style. And when you go into galleries today, do you go to London and, and around the galleries? Are there any uh, any historical figures in art uh, as work that you admire, apart from George Stubbs? Well, apart from George Stubbs, because obviously I'd go straight to the National Gallery and go and see Whistle Jacket. (laughs) But another one that I love is the Wallace Collection, because they have one painting, which is my second favourite all time, is a portrait painted of a horse painted by Edmund Landseer of this beautiful Arabian horse yes. who's grey with her foal lying on a Persian rug in this sort of Arabic tent. And it's, oh, it's so beautiful. It is. I can see it in my mind's eye now as you describe it. Yeah, you know the one. <laughs> Very much so, yes. Beautiful painting. Beautiful. Anyone else that you recommend and people should look at in terms of, it seems to be equine-related art that you and landscapes that you favour? Yes, I again, I'm so single track minded that any painting with a horse in it draw my attention. But I do have other friends I've studied with, actually, who I respect so much as artists. And one of those is a girl called Daisy Sims Hilditch. She paints these fabulous landscapes. And again, she's somebody I'd love to learn from. And then there's Henrietta Abel Smith, who at the moment is preparing for an exhibition and she paints these st- really amazing Still lives of mostly of flowers and anyway she's incredibly skillful and if I could paint like her as well I'd be so happy. Now it seems to me being a pony mad girl that you were your bookshelves will probably have lots of horse books on them but is is that all that's on them are you totally as you say single track minded there or, or are there other things that we would find? There is one other type of book written by one single author, and I have the whole collection of his works, and that is a good Irishman named Oscar Wilde, and I'm madly in love with his writing. 
that's something that I think most people can identify with. And <laughs> would your parents or would your family, would they have taken you to galleries and museums when you were a child? You know, the sad thing is they never did because we lived on Mustique on the island and there was zero culture to see. So I was just lucky that boarding school took me first, you know, my first ever trip to London was on the school bus to go to the National Gallery. When you realised that you were going to be an artist, that's what you wanted to do as a career. Did you have a fallback plan, though, Madeleine? You know, the the, the vet career fell through, um, but you knew you had a plan B, and a plan, plan B is working very well, but did you have a plan C in case that didn't work? Plan B very quickly became plan A, and I, my ships were burnt. There was no <laughs> other choice. I, I have no other choice. This is all I'm good at, and so... From the, you know, as soon as I left art school, I knew there was nothing else for me but painting horses. It's lovely to have have it carved out so clearly for you. What do you like to hear about your paintings? What I don't like is when people say, oh, it looks like it could be a photograph. <laughs> because, because that means it's sort of still and stagnant. And But I love it when people say, more people say um, that I've captured the horse's character. To me, if I can get that, the way the horse is, holds its head, or or it's the way it's even just the way its nostril curves, you know, the owners of that horse they know them so well that the slightest little bit of detail that I get that represents that specific horse's character, if they tell me I've got that, then I'm very happy. You're onto a winner there. Yes, most definitely. And I'm curious about the light that you need when you're doing these uh, life paintings, Madeline, because it, clearly that's all, everything when you're painting. Do you have lighting set up or do you rely on natural light? I do always use natural light. We have in my studio, this beautiful barn that has one very high window. I close all the other doors so it's totally dark apart from this one stream of light that comes down at a 45 degree angle and just sort of melts over the horse and so it really picks up all the different angles of the muscles and catches little bits of their mane, the hair. And so lighting is everything. It's so difficult to paint a nice portrait without good lighting. Yes, absolutely. Have you ever had a horse that says, look, I'm I'm not doing this. No, thank you very much. Get me out of here. <laughs> so many. My oh, gosh, and the amount. It, it's always the first day when I bring them into the studio and the horses are slightly freaked out because they see all these huge paintings of other horses and it's a dark room and they've never been in there before and they really get in a bit of a state. But we just have to be calm and reassure them and give them some treats. <laughs> Just let them know that it's all fine and happy. And, you know, day after day, they come back and they're more and more happy with each sitting. And by the end, they practically think that barn is their stable. Well, that's, that's what you want, isn't it? Right. Exactly. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in the future, though, Madeline, what you, you've got a list of to do, to do lists now. This is going to take you a while. But where would you see your, you know, in the very long term? what your legacy might become over time, you know, when you create, you know, creating this huge portfolio. I suppose I've always wanted to be like Stubbs. I, if I could, I remember the first time I saw a painting of his in a book and just the feeling of awe that was evoked in me. If I could create that for some other child, you know, in a hundred years time, then that's what I'm aiming for. I just, I th yeah, I want to paint all the different breeds in the world, all life size, and I hope they just will just get better and better as the years go on. How about action, though? Do you do you capture them in action? Not yet. It's so difficult. I will. I just need to practice a lot more of doing drawings of horses cantering and jumping. But at the moment, they're all still stagnant. Yes. Well, I think of the work of Klaus Philippe, the German artist. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he was so clever at that um, with his pencil sketches and his oil paintings, mostly of thoroughbreds. 
but yes, it would love well, that would be lovely. But, but it seems to me that you're working your way very nicely there to making a name for yourself as an equine artist of note. And with all these portraits, you're really making your mark because they're so big. They, these are the whistle jackets of today, aren't they? That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Fantastic. And you now, do you paint every day? all day or is this a is this a discipline that you have or or do you just have set times that you paint and uh, how does your t- day typically pan out Madeline? in between riding and drinking tea i do spend a lot of time painting <laughs> so i will often have two sessions a day if i'm organized enough because it takes a lot to have a horse holder and a horse available so if I've got that all settled, then I'll have a, a a couple of hours session in the morning and then again a separate another horse or another painting in the afternoon. And that's my that'll be the uh, that'll be a great day for me because often it's only one horse. Sometimes it's not even one at all. And what does your riding involve? I am what kind of rider am I? Very loose and relaxed. I just my horses all live Out in the field, I'll just grab in whichever one I want to ride and go for a spin around the countryside. I'm not much into competitions purely because I haven't had the time. I'm so busy painting. I can't train horses at the same time. Well, finally, Madeline, if you were to talk to a little Chris Stafford who always wanted to draw her pony and never could, what would you say? I'd tell you to squint and look. Um... Squinting, it was what Charles Cecil always told us to do. And it helps you see the lights from the darks. And so you'd always start with an outline and then you fill in all the shadows and that then describes the lights. And to get a three-dimensional, beautiful piece, you always have to squint and look. All right. Well, you know we have plenty of horses around here in Middleburg, so I'm going to go and squint and look and take my pencil and sketchbook. (laughs) <laughs> well Madeline it's been lovely to talk to you I'm looking forward to meeting you when you come into my backyard here in Middleburg in a few weeks absolutely that, that will be fun and thank you so much for taking time to come on my podcast it's been a pleasure thank you for the conversation and and very very best of luck with your career thank you Chris You'll find links to Madeline's social media and to her website in the show notes accompanying this episode. And don't forget, whilst you're on social media, do check us out on Instagram. We're at The Art Podcast. That's art with two A's. And we're also on Facebook at The Hollowell Studios. And if you have any comments, questions or suggestions for guests, we would love to hear from you. Do post a comment or DM us on Instagram. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, then please do leave us a review and rating because that raises our profile and helps others find the show. I'll be back next week with another episode, so I do hope you'll join me then. In the meanwhile, thank you to my guest Madeline Bunbury and to you for listening. (laughs) 